Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Native HIV Network's third webinar, Harm Reduction Strategies During the COVID Pandemic in Native Communities. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Diné, Apache, Pueblo, and Ute people of the Southwest United States. So today's webinar is going to be recorded and it will be shared on the National Native HIV Network's Facebook page and also our YouTube page. My name is Savannah Jean. So today we will be doing introductions, um, going over a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're gonna give an overview of the National Native HIV Network and we have four wonderful presenters joining us today. And then we will have a facilitated discussion and Q&A. Today's webinar will be um, going over the hour, um, should be between an hour and an hour and a half. Um, because we have a lot of great information to share with you today. Moderators today, again, my name is Savannah Jean. I'm the STD HIV AIDS Prevention Director at the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board. I'm also an administrator for the National Native HIV Network. Um, I am Tkutlani, Big Water, born for the um, Yucca Fruit Strung Out on the Line, or Hushka my maternal grandparents are Tangle people, or Tkutnasani, and my paternal grandparents are mini goats, or Izathana. I'm originally from Arizona, and I am Dene. Um, I've been working with the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board for about 10 years, um, and so I'm happy for you all to be here. My co-moderator, Elton Noswood, will be joining us a little bit later. Um, he lives and works in Denver, Colorado. He works for the National Association of American Indian Court Judges, but he moonlights as our coordinator for the National Native HIV Network. So we're happy um, that you could all join us today. Our presenters are here, Annette Hubbard, Jessica Renstra, Claudette Thor, and Lee Torres. And we'll learn a little bit more about them as they begin their presentations today. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this session again is being recorded and will be shared on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. Please introduce yourself with your name, tribal affiliation and agency in the chat box. Um, you know, the virtual meetings and webinars are definitely different where we would normally designate a whole hour for introductions, but we have our chat box feature for that. Um, and then, any questions that you have, please put that into the Q&A section. Our presenters um, can either respond directly to you there, or we can address those questions um, in our facilitated discussion at the end of today's, all of our webinars today. And then um, there is gonna be an evaluation that will be emailed to you, and then you will also be linked directly to that SurveyMonkey evaluation. Um, and your feedback is definitely a gift and helps us plan and improve all of the services we offer. So the National Native HIV Network um, was created in 2017 as a community led effort to increase and organize a national voice and presence in the HIV movement from the American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian communities. With support from the Indian Health Service and the HHS Office of Secretaries Minority HIV AIDS Fund, the AIHB or the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board coordinates a wide array of key stakeholders from the 12 IHS areas to form the National Native HIV Network. The network provides guidance and input to assist IHS and other agencies in our efforts to reach high-risk American Indian Alaska Native populations with HIV testing, prevention, and treatment. And in action, builds group capacity and provides assistance to support extensive community engagement strategies, dissemination of information at regional and national levels, and also supports professional and leadership development to sustain these efforts. So these are our regions. Um, they, we include Hawaii with our Native Hawaiian relatives. Um, and each of these regions has have representatives. We are currently working on a website so that we can provide that information 
with resources and um, links to all of our different regions. Our first presenter joining us today is Annette Hubbard. She is the Behavioral Health Aid, Recovery Services, and um, Outreach Worker with the Tribal Opioid Response Grant. And she's also the Tribal Opioid Response Grant Program Director and a TA consultant for NASDA. Annette is an Alaska Native in long-term recovery who has personal experience with harm reduction treatment. She currently works as a medication-assisted treatment case manager and behavioral health aid for the Ninilchik Traditional Council and has worked there since October 2016. She is currently enrolled in the Rural Health Services Program through the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She advocates for medication assistance treatment, harm reduction, overdose prevention, mental health services, and substance user health care. In her spare time, Annette enjoys doing yoga and cycling, fishing, camping, traveling around Alaska. Annette is also an active volunteer and outreach worker at the Homer Syringe Exchange. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Annette. Hi everybody, my name is Annette. Um, yeah, I, so um, I, my presentation is not up. Do I need to share my screen? Savannah? Um, your presentation should be up. No, but I have it pulled up here. So hold on one second. Technical difficulties. Let me switch over to a different. So overview of harm reduction strategies. Um, never, okay. I am having, okay. So my background, um, so I am Alaska Native, I am Aleut, I live down in Nanilchik, which is down by Homer on the southern Kenai Peninsula. Uh, I've tried to leave Alaska a couple of times and I just cannot. <laughs> uh, so I do currently live in my tribal area, which is, um, like I said, on the southern Kenai Peninsula. I originally started out as a medication assisted treatment case manager. Uh, and how I got into uh, harm reduction work is uh, I got introduced through the Manitoba Harm Reduction Coalition uh, through the uh, Alaska Naval Tribal Health Consortium and was invited to, uh, to a conference that they had put on. And I, I work with a medical provider. Her name is Dr. Sarah Spencer. And we uh, had been kind of struggling with some of our patients uh, with it. We were trying to build kind of, you know, a, um, a, we've been building a treatment program and uh, we kind of looked at each other and said like this is really what we need to do. She's also the director, the medical director of the Homer Syringe Exchange program down here, uh, which is the only rural syringe exchange program in Alaska. And uh, she'd been really trying to get me involved in that because that's where a lot of our, uh, she was, you know, recruiting patients from there. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I got involved in syringe exchange. Um, there wasn't much long uh, after that. So our exchange program recently became um, a nonprofit. And so I'm pretty active in that. And like it says, I'm a board member now. Uh, I send out re reminder texts to our participants of when the exchange is. I provide education to active users. Uh, and then we just started a peer distribution program. Uh, I also am a TA provider for NASTAD. Um, and So, uh, so Alaska Native cultural values. This is really how, you know, harm reduction is very culturally relevant. Uh, I spend time with active users kind of talking to them, you know, uh, we're here to set up services for people, for people. 
Um, so, you know, when you sit down and have a conversation with somebody about what's going on in their life, it really shows respect to other people. Um, it take, gives them the opportunity to talk with, you know, you, you really sit down and you listen to, to some, to what's going on with them. And I think that's really the most uh, rewarding thing that I really get out of this. It, um, I really want to highlight this kind of work. Um, and I think sometimes we can take that for granted. So what is harm reduction? It's a public health philosophy. You know, every, we engage in high risk behavior all the time. And I think it's really important to, to know that it's a spectrum of strategies and that there's no universal definition uh, or formula for implementing harm reduction. So I think when I look at this and I just kind of say, so I live in a really small community where we don't have a lot of services. And so we see something that's happening and we just kind of look for a solution uh, to fix the problem or you know, something that's happening. And, and, then we, and then we go, okay, well, that's not working. So let's try this. So it, there's no, you know, for everybody, it's gonna be different. Uh, and sometimes we kind of, uh, we always tell people like, okay, so for you, this is what we'll be doing. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some multiple different treatment options um, and some different things in harm reduction too. Uh, in Alaska, we do a lot of subsistence activities. And so life jackets is really a huge in initiative. People around here in some villages, the only transportation is snow machines and four wheelers boats. So I think I wanna touch about, uh, talk about uh, harm reduction is wearing a life jacket. Harm reduction is, uh, you know, we promote condoms when you're having a new partner or anything. It's also safe injection, providing safe injection supplies. And I don't promote drug use, but I also don't promote car accidents either. So please wear a seatbelt. The goals of harm reduction are always, you know, to save lives. I was on a conference call yesterday with our uh, tribal opiate response coordinators. And remember that the number one criteria for people, for us to do our work is for them to be alive. So uh, it helps to save money. I'm gonna talk about uh, some other medications later on, um, promote public safety and the dignity of other pe you know, people who are out there just kind of struggle, you know, struggling. Is harm reduction enabling? And this is really where my entire world uh, changed. No, it's not. Um, you know, everybody's really engaging in high Behaviors. I uh, really had to think about this question, you know, even in my own life, what are some high risk uh, behaviors that I am doing? But it is as well. It's helping them keep safe while they're engaging in them. It helps to reduce HIV, Hep C transmissions. And number two, like the number one thing is that it helps people to be honest about their drug use or their behavior because they live in so much shame sometimes. And nobody, you know, the only people that really know what's going on with them are the people that they're engaging in that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they want to get out, but they don't know where to get those resources are. And they, it helps them to see their strengths and what they can do uh, to reach whatever goal that they want to do. Harm reduction work is very individualized. Like I said, you know, what works for one person might not work for the other person. And so kind of as you go along and you start to do this work, you, you kind of start to put things in your toolbox and you go... Um, you, uh, you learned these little tips and, and keywords that you get to say uh, along the way to, to help people help themselves and guide them along their journey. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about harm reduction for sex workers because I don't necessarily know 100% who all is on this call, but uh, it's kind of, you know, heart, like I said, harm reduction is everything from seatbelts to condoms. And so there's a beautiful uh, presentation by my Heart Heartland Alliance, which is where I got a lot of this information. PrEP is becoming a really big thing, and it's not just for men who have sex with men anymore. Anybody can um, take it. And they also are prescribing it for um, people who inject drugs as well. I am gonna move through some of these slides pretty quick because I just have a ton of information and resources and I'm, uh, they'll send out these slides later. So there's a lot of different acronyms around there, SAPs, SSPs, SCPs, what are all these things? And so I just wanted to highlight SAPs, um, 
are syringe access programs. So these might be like a, a walk-in drop-in center where people can come in and get social services, telehealth, I'm not sure how to get back. Um, and, um, and then SCPs are just kind of a, a basic uh, syringe access plan where people just go in and Savannah, if you, oh, there we go. Um, SSPs are syringe service programs, which insinuates that you only offer syringe-based services only. There are a couple one-for-one -one places in Alaska, which means you bring in one, you get one back. Needs-based, our syringe exchange program is uh, here in Homer is a needs-based. So we hand out, um, you know, somebody can walk in and bring us no supplies and we give them, you know, 300 syringes and cooker, you know, all the supplies that they'll need. Secondary distribution, peer distribution are um, designated people who might use in a group or a cohort, or they are um, people who uh, are just able, they just know where everybody lives and so they can go out there because, you know, in rural communities, um, people might live in, uh, not have transportation or on a, wherever you guys are at, they might just not know you might not, they might not want to come out to your exchange program. Medication assisted treatment is MAT. MAT uh, is a lot of different things nowadays. And I will talk about that. SA, SAPs provide safe injection supplies. They also provide safe disposal supplies. They educate about dangerous issues on the street. They're a huge linkage to care and a support team. They provide community testing services. And I'm going to talk about that here in two seconds. This is a flyer for our exchange down here. We hand these out on little tiny postcards and there's flyers put up in the public bathrooms. This is how we provide education about um, how to clean a syringe, have C testing, fentanyl testing strips are huge. This is basically, if you are not an SSP and you work in a healthcare facility, you can purchase fentanyl testing strips. This is what they look like. All it does is tell them what they can that if their drugs have fentanyl in it, this is the very ground basic of harm reduction right here. All it, so that they'll, they'll know if they have fentanyl in their dr uh, drugs or not. So um, fentanyl is in everything nowadays, we know that. And the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium has a pilot project. Um, it's not pilot anymore, it's been going on for quite a while. There are these big, huge packs and they have uh, never share, probably not anymore because those are really expensive, uh, but there's these things called never share, never share syringes. They're different colors um, and they're coated with the cookers as well so that people don't um, cross contaminate. They've got filters, vitamin C. They're really, really nice. They're like the Cadillac of, uh, of packs. And there's a YouTube video down here. You can see what they've got. So during SAP is during COVID times, because when uh, COVID hit, we, you know, everybody had to move outdoors. Some SAPs shut down. Um, a lot of people increasing sanitation supplies, alcohol pads, hand sanitizers, offering more supplies because you're going to have to limit your hours and people were going to be able to use less. We, we, that's when we implemented our secondary distribution. But increasing your outreach, because a lot of people who use didn't know if SAPs were open. They didn't even know if their healthcare clinic was open. In some places, public health is the SAP, and that's where they go to get their regular health care. And so, um, so when I'm doing my TA calls, I'm hearing, well, people don't know that we're open. Okay, well, what about your outreach? What's your outreach strategy about prepackaging materials? You have to go where they are. They're not necessarily going to come to you because, you know, Think about how hard it is for us to keep track of all the things that are happening. You know, one week everything's shut down, the next week things are totally open. We never know. So imagine if you don't have a cell phone, you don't know where things are, you know, that, that can be really, really um, exhausting. So um, these are the CDC recommendations. You know, it's easy for us because we're on board with everything, you know, we, we get emails all the time. So we know what's going on, but they are not aware. People can pick up prescriptions sometimes at the pharmacy. Sometimes they require a prescription. And uh, so here's a little bit about pharmacy distribution. Medical providers can write a prescription. Um, 
So just wanna talk about people who smoke, people who use drugs, no matter what drug, um, they should be able to have access to safer supplies. And so during COVID, it's important to remember that uh, COVID is transmitted by saliva. Sharing pipes or stems can be transmitted by the virus. It is in the interest of public health during a pandemic to make these supplies available. Um, so we started offering prior to COVID uh, safe smoking supplies because we had a small smoking population and we didn't want to exclude them. Um, they were picking up syringes for their friends. And so these are supplies that you can purchase. Project HOPE is uh, ran through the state of Alaska. They provide Narcan kits. Um, and this is what our Narcan kits look like. Typical, um, two cans of Narcan. One is for, uh, two are provided in case of a fentanyl overdose. Medication assisted treatment. There are three medications uh, used to treat opiate use disorder methadone, which is the most, uh, most favorable. Buprenorphine, which is mostly available, you need to have your provider needs to have a data waiver, and naltrexone, um, which is Vivitrol or comes in a tablet as well. In our clinic, we use Sublocade for harm reduction patients uh, and non harm reduction patients. It's a monthly injection, it lasts about 30 to 45 days. And um, Patients who are actively using other illicit substances, we do have a population of harm reduction patients who are very satisfied with Sublocade. Uh, it does block the effects of uh, opiates that they do uh, use, and they are able to function, go to work, uh, be uh, important members of their family, uh, and continue to, to use. Hep C treatment, treatment is prevention. Um, they, it's important that they have access to clean supplies. It, they can be on MAT. Uh, we recently had somebody who, uh, because of where they live, they were unable, um, they only had to complete a month of treatment, I'll just say that. CDC recommends PrEP for uh, IV drug users. So again, here's some of your um, resources. Nothing for me without me was uh, something very important that came out of the Manitoba Harm Reduction Coalition that I uh, had attended to. So we got together, I did a practicum for a project uh, and got an active users group together. And uh, I learned so much from those guys and it really helped uh, strengthen our program. But we talked about how to clean syringes, how to improve the exchange, new services. We built an entire program and an outreach office for ourselves for that. Uh, I learned about uh, from uh, my cohort, Ryan, about this service called Never Use Alone, which has come into very handy, you know, because uh, uh, this is a 1-800 number that people can call if they're going to use by themselves. Resources for active users. Uh, people can carry a card if they are a secondary distribu distributor. Safe injection instructions. This, uh, I believe this link goes to the IHS website. Um, which talks about uh, for IHS uh, clinics. And then the Harm Reduction Coalition, if you don't know about the Harm Reduction Coalition, uh, they are fantastic. I attended a webinar last week on um, safe injection supplies and how to talk about safe injection supplies with non-clinical users. These are regular resources. Next Distro is a mail out service. Um, and uh, they're great if you need to get in touch with them. August 31st is International Overdose Awareness Day. Um, our community is cutting purple ribbons and tying them to a tree in a community park to make it aware. This is my contact information if you would like to, uh, we've been talking about some different stuff. We have uh, calls every week for NASA to talk about SA, how to make SAPs and SSPs more readily available in communities. So if you're interested in getting involved in that, you can uh, email me at this address. Um, and if you would like to put in a TA request through NASTAT for harm reduction in drug user health, this is um, a link for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annette, for that, all of the information. I know we have a wealth of information being provided by all of our presenters. 
Again, this presentation is being recorded and we can share the PowerPoint slides in PDF form um, once we get permission from all of our presenters. Again, just a reminder, if you could use the Q&A section for your questions, that way they don't get lost in the chat box. Um, the Q&A is on the bottom portion of your menu. Our next presenter is Jessica Renstra. Um, she is the ECHO case manager at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Jessica is a registered nurse at Northwest Area Indian Health Board working with, as an ECHO case manager. Prior to joining the ECHO team at MPAIHB, she worked at a tribal health center where she helped develop and implement harm reduction, syringe service, and HCV elimination programs. She is passionate about ensuring accessible, destigmatized, and intentional care for all. So I will turn it over to Jessica and just a note for our presenters, I um, just let me know which when you want to go to the next slide. Great. Well, thank you so much and huge thanks, Annette. That was so much amazing information. It's really great to be here um, and to be sharing and learning from all of you. Um, so like Savannah mentioned, I am the ECHO case manager at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and um, came prior to that um, from the Lummi Tribal Health Center working for several years in our harm reduction and syringe service programs. So today I'm going to share some of the experience of working in the tribal health facility and how we grew our SSP program um, and also how utilizing the ECHO services was a really key part in advocating for the health of all of our patients and offering lower barrier access to care for those clients who do utilize SSPs, especially during um, this time of pandemic during COVID when it seems like there are quite a few additional barriers for connection to treatment and care for patients. So harm reduction, um, oh, and also the views that I am sharing are my own um, and my own experiences. And I do wanna acknowledge that um, place to place and person to person, these could look different, but I will be sharing um, from my experiences um, as a nurse working in these environments. So harm reduction um, offers interventions uh, aimed at reducing negative health effects. And Annette went into amazing detail on this. Um, I think often, the topic of harm reduction can be really polarizing and sometimes emotionally charged, just the term of it. Um, but really, in my opinion, when, when we look at healthcare, harm reduction is something that is seen and modeled throughout all healthcare in all management of disease processes. And so it should be no different when it comes to substance use disorders. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to touch a little bit on the background of the syringe program and also just that it was a really iterative and constantly changing process for us. So initially starting in 2013 um, and had a really um, a pretty small outcome and then due to how it was set up it was you know one day a week and it was outside of the clinic setting um, and the attendance kind of fell off quite a bit. Um, I started in the program um, in 2015 and we, we started it again, taking feedback from the clients and their needs and their desires. And we transitioned it to a primary integrated care syringe service program. So when someone accessed a point of contact with the SSP, they could also then get that same day access with primary care for any concerns, whether it was an abscess or something not related at all to um, SUD. Next slide, please. So why the program began um, looking up at the rate and the disparities for hepatitis C and the cases of hepatitis C. Um, so we really started as an effort to prevent and decrease transmission of bloodborne infections, but grew quite a bit from there. Next slide, please. So this is a fairly common chart, but just again shows like the massive health disparities that I think at times, um, unfortunately, just become like a known fact instead of a motivational call to action. Like, how can we actively intentionally change this? Next slide, please. 
So a big part of the growing of the SSP was to make a really clear and um, easy to understand purpose and known intent. And that was for internal staff, as well as for community members, as well as for um, larger population, just so it was really clear. So there wasn't any um, confusion about why we were starting the program and what we were planning to do with that. I think it's pretty common that purpose and goals can change over time, but this was where we started with ours. Next slide, please. And again, having a really simple, straightforward and understandable procedure. Um, and while we are offering these supplies, we're also aiming to continue to make the location safe. And so just um, acknowledging boundaries, um, absolutely having it open doors for all to come in, but also having signs posted that um, there is no drug use on the property. Next slide, please. So the massive key for us was just to keep this very patient centered. If it's not offering services that the clients need, then it's not going to grow as a program and it's not gonna have the capacity that it could if it's led by individual client needs. So like Annette mentioned, nothing about us without us. So it um, needs to be driven by the stated needs of the clients in your community and that can change over time as well. So I think often a question that I would get is how do we get an SSP started? And I really think the first person to ask is your patient. So it's this big spectrum that harm reduction incorporates. Um, so looking at different strategies for safer use and that could look different community to community and also change over time. Next slide, please. This may seem really straightforward and obvious, but transmission route should never limit a patient's access to appropriate health care. And thankfully, a lot of laws have progressed and changed over the years supporting this, but connection to specialty care is still a pretty significant barrier for a lot of our clients. Um, and so accessing um, the echo clinics and being able to advocate for patients um, and get them connected to specialists. And all they needed to do was just continue to show up for their SSP visit or have a point of contact with us um, was a, a huge step in being able to start the HCV elimination program at Lummi. Next slide, please. So again, focusing on this spectrum of harm and really centering the client again, what are their personal goals? What, would they like to work on being safer at? How can we educate um, on how practices could be the safest where they're at? So not trying to quickly shuffle everybody all the way into the green of never injecting, but really acknowledging where, where they are and, and what they would like help with. Next slide, please. So patient education, um, we really have a strong message of one needle, one use, one time. Um, a lot of folks were continuing not sharing syringes, but maybe reusing. And so just getting the outreach out there for folks to know that, yes, there are clean and sterile supplies here and access to them. So you never have to reuse a syringe, just like this needle point shows, you know, after one use, the tip of a needle starts to degrade after six uses it's quite broken down and a really high risk for abscess and infection, even if it is just being utilized by a single person. Next slide, please. So here are some of the supplies that we, uh, that they give out at the SSP. And initially, um, we started with vanish point syringes with the idea that, you know, with one use, then the needle is tracked back into the syringe and it can only be used one time. Um, and then had feedback from our clients that those actually were kind of jumpy and a little bit more difficult to use. And so switched out types and continue to switch out products depending on what the majority of clients ask for, as well as making it really easy for safe disposal. So if that means somebody wants to call in and have um, their sharps containers picked up if they don't feel comfortable coming in, or if they need supplies dropped off somewhere, or any other way to continue safe disposal of supplies. 
Next slide, please. Another huge push of the program is easy and safe access to Narcan. So Narcan for anybody um, who comes in, you know, extra if they would like some for family members or friends or to have in their house or in their car, um, just ensuring that the community has access to Narcan. Next slide, please. So harm reduction, these are just a few of the um, main points that we're focusing on. I think I'll go ahead and skip to the next slide, Savannah. And these are a few of the um, medical issues that we were able to address for patients who were coming in to access the syringe services. Oftentimes, I would hear from a client who had a very treatable medical um, concern that this was just you know, part of the lifestyle and it was something that they had kind of accepted was maybe a consequence of their use when, when it was a very addressable, very treatable condition. So again, just letting um, clients know that you know, we as their healthcare team are here for them and we're here to help them achieve their best health in all areas and um, really advocating for their access to get treatment for whatever health concerns they're facing. Next slide, please. Well, this is a, actually an older slide, but it is just as true today as ever. Harm reduction is very cost effective. We had done a um, cost analysis two years ago um, for all of the supplies and staffing, um, et cetera, that would go into one patient annually for harm reduction. And it was just over $2,000 annually. Um, and the same medical expenditures for a person um, for uh, treatment of diabetes was $13,700 per patient per year. So um, really it's a very cost effective uh, to treat and to offer access to. Um, so just as a reminder, it is very, very cost effective to supply harm reduction. Next slide, please. Here are a couple of the things that they are doing. They've added in the large outdoor sharps disposal containers around um, the community so that people can access them. And then also just continuing to work on destigmatizing language um, internally with self, like checking for stigma with self, with coworkers, um, with the larger group, as well as the larger community. So placing these signs on our sharps containers just so that nobody is um, feeling stigmatized by the use. So a sharps container is for anything, it's for broken glass, it's for an old EpiPen, it's for an old insulin syringe. So really normalizing the use of keeping the community safe for everyone and by everyone. Next slide, please. And a few other projects that um, they have worked on is just also offering education and being present at community events. So just continuing outreach. Um, Lummi hosted the Paddle to Lummi in uh, 2019 and having you know, harm reduction staff for education and supplies at the different first aid tents, uh, keeping Sharp's disposal containers available throughout, as well as um, they made these stickers that I love, just letting people know that they have Narcan on them and that they're, you know, that's a, someone that someone can go to if they need Narcan. So people would put it on their windows or their car. I um, thought that was really great. Next slide, please. And the next two slides are actually both um, some media from the destigmatizing campaign. Uh, next slide, please. And just a reminder that, you know, stigma causes shame and shame brings a lot of silence and silence hurts all of us. Um, and as someone working in healthcare, if the patient feels shame and um, is silent about behaviors, then that really limits the amount of care that we're able to give them and the effective treatment that we're able to offer. So we really have to offer a shame-free environment and continue to fight daily on um, offering a destigmatized environment. Next slide, please. So overall, integrating the primary care um, SSP offered a lot more anonymity for each patient, as well as a lot of patient autonomy in deciding how the program was going to um, be run. And then really started building and is continuing to build and the folks that are still working there are doing incredible innovative work and just fostering individual connection because there was a lot of um, trust broken and um, yeah, mistrust with the healthcare. And so 
fostering the individual connection has rebuilt so much trust and strengthened the program and allowed for a lot of innovative changes. Next slide, please. So kind of transitioning into my current job, even though a lot of the echo was stuff that I had accessed as a nurse in my previous job, um, this is talking a little bit about the ECHOs, which is Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, and they're tele-echo conferences. So um, a doctor, an MA, a nurse, a caseworker um, could present a case to any one of these ECHOs, a harm reduction ECHO, HCV, diabetes, SUD, et cetera, and then get recommendations from a specialist and bring that recommendation back to the patient. So if I had a patient um, that showed up at the SSP and I knew weekly they were coming, but they really had too many barriers to make it to an appointment um, to see you know, a specialist for hepatitis C treatment. Um, if the patient was interested, I could write up their information and then take that, present it to a specialist in an echo clinic, get the recommendations, bring that back, have their primary care doctor review that, um, offer treatment, and then the next time the patient came to the syringe service program, review all of that with the client, um, get them access to their medication in that same visit, um, and start treating and curing their disease process. So the um, harm reduction echo sessions are on the first Tuesday of every month from 12 to one. And the program provides uh, comprehensive information um, for those interested in starting harm reduction programs and also a place to share best practices. Uh, a lot of it is troubleshooting complex questions and continuing to ensure that our people are receiving the care that they need when they need it in their own community. So if anybody is interested um, in more information on that or available to join, please do feel free to reach out via email. I would be happy to connect you. I think, next slide. Um, so that was kind of a lot of information all compact. So please do reach out with any questions. And I do just wanna take a moment to remind everyone, um, this is really incredible work that everyone's involved in and that you are sacred and beloved um, and the work that you're doing matters. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Jessica. And Jessica has provided additional resources here. Again, we'll be sending out the slides in a follow-up email. And I'm going to hand this over to Elton, who will introduce our next presenter. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar series. Um, I'm happy to join everyone here today as well. And Thank you for our other co-presenters who were able to present prior to our next presentation. So I'd like to introduce Claudette Thor. Uh, Claudette is the clinical manager at the Front Street Clinic in Juneau, Alaska. Claudette has earned her Bachelor's of Arts in Criminal Justice and her Master's of Science in Human Resources Counseling. <clears throat> prior to joining Search, she spent significant time in leadership roles in medication assisted treatment and the community mental health field. She also worked in both administrative and clinical positions with diversionary programs and co-occurring addictions and SMIs. So if you would help me in welcoming Claudette, we will uh, have her present on the next section here. Thank you, Elton. I really appreciate it being invited. It's, it's an honor. Um, so, as um, Elton said, my name is Claudette Thor. I am the clinic manager at Front Street Clinic. We are a part of the Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium, um, which is the tribal regional health organization for Southeast Alaska. Um, we have offices in 28 communities providing medical, dental, behavioral health, and specialty care services. So Front Street Clinic is, is a little unique. Um, we are a federally qualified healthcare center um, in Juneau. Juneau has a population of approximately 32,000 people, and we are both land and um, waterlocked. Um, our clinic offers um, on-site medical, dental, behavioral health, um, 
services and um, including medication assisted treatment and harm reduction services. Um, so regardless of anybody's ability to pay, um, we will again provide services to the whole community. Um, next slide. Oh, back, there you go. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of um, our service locations. Next slide, please. So with COVID-19, um, we started to see a huge need for a rise in services. Um, some of the things that contributed to those things were state mandates and shutdowns. Um, the population in Juneau relies much upon tourism-related employment. Um, our schools moved to online learning. Employers shut down or could no longer remain in business due to these shutdowns. Um, many businesses turned to work from home travel in Southeast Alaska um, became restricted. Our smaller villages and communities um, were restricting who came in and out. Um, bus service locally um, had reduction in services, only allowing like nine people at a time on the bus. Um, so um, yeah. Um, just a huge impact with the um, state mandates. Then our um, homeless shelter um, that served a large portion of our homeless in Juneau had to significantly decrease their census um, and additional services allowing only nighttime shelter um, they opened or expanded services at a warming shelter open from 8 p.m. until 8 a.m. And um, soup kitchens or meal services were drastically reduced as well. In April, we started to see a increase in um, opioid overdoses, um, some of those fentanyl related. Um, where we hadn't had a rash of those in quite some time. Um, those are continuing um, throughout as recent as last weekend. Um, and then recently um, there was provisional CDC data that indicates um, in Alaska overall, there was a 25% increase in the number of opioid related deaths. Um, then finally, um, COVID-19 related fear. The population we serve, um, many of these people are underserved. They, um, they were scared of COVID. A lot of them had no shelter or nowhere to safely um, uh, shelter or um, on their own. Um, there weren't resources for basic safety precautions, no masks, no hand sanitizer, no wipes, those things that we often take for granted. Um, so all of those things um, contributed to a huge rise in um, need for services. Next slide, please. So this is just a um, brief um, overlook of um, the increase in our harm reduction kit distribution. Um, so going back for the past year um, up through the middle, um, late June. So um, these services, I mean, we tripled, quadrupled the number of harm reduction kits we were dispersing in our centers and then um, in late April, early May, um, we had partnered with um, 4As, and I'll get into more details. They are doing um, uh, syringe distribution. Although we are not, um, we do not typically do that, um, we 
we partnered with somebody and we went from 35 um, individuals um, receiving exchange services to 89 in a matter of four months. Next slide, please. And then again, this was the total number of syringes distributed um, during that period, um, as well as the returns we received. Next slide, please. So what kind of strategies did we use to meet the needs of um, our population during COVID-19? Um, you know, Annette Hubbard said earlier, you know, there's no universal definition or formula for implementing harm reduction. We had to do what we could to make sure that our patients and um, the people that came into our clinic um, received what they needed to be successful and stay safe and alive. So we've had partnerships with Project HOPE um, who um, I guess for the last three years and um, they provide our Narcan kits. Um, the Alaska Tri Native Tribal Health Consortium, ANTHC, and I think Annette mentioned the, them as well, um, have been providing us with harm reduction kits. Um, there's a photo at the bottom. Um, so we've been doing that for about the last year, a little over a year now. Um, the 4As or Alaska AIDS Assistance Association um, based in Anchorage with an office here in Juneau has provided us um, syringe exchange, um, additional testing, um, and we since took over um, for a period of about four months, um, took over their exchange services when they had to shut down um, due to COVID-19. Um, the Central Cl Council of Clinket and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska are a huge supporter of our population. And um, they offer a variety of family-centered services, um, focusing on supporting safe and stable families. And, sorry, I had a pop-up. Um, other community partners are shelters, um, our hospital, our medical providers, social service organizations, court programs. Um, we have, we're fortunate in having a lot of resources. Um, so those are the, the majority of our partners that have been very beneficial um, during COVID-19. So let's talk about safety. So in our clinic, um, we started screening anybody that came in for services. Um, whether that be harm reduction services, medical, whatever their needs were, we wanted to make sure they were safe. Um, we offered testing for patients that had COVID type symptoms um, and those that were experiencing homelessness, we were able to receive rapid testing with results in um, two to 24 hours. Our agency also provided provides asymptomatic testing for the staff um, on, it started as a biweekly testing and went to weekly testing as supplies came more available. Um, but we also offer asymptomatic testing in most of our communities, one to two days a week, um, regardless of anybody's ability to pay in one location um, that's easily accessible um, to most of the communities. Next slide, please. I think I forgot. Okay. So masking, again, all of our patients, those, those people um, that were otherwise not able to get masks and feel some sort of protection, um, we offered them masking when they came in to help decrease risk. Um, sorry, and our staff, of course, masks. Um, 
And then finally, just being flexible. Um, Project Hope has sent us additional Narcan kits to meet um, the increased needs after the rash of, of overdoses in our community. ANTHC was on work from home and um, they made arrangements to go into the office and um, get us supplies packed up so we could meet the growing need um, of harm reduction in the community. Um, they expedited shipping and um, continue to do so as we have a need for more supplies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we later partnered with 4As um, by facilitating their syringe exchange um, late April, early May through um, July. We provided, um, supplemented those services that they had previous, previously provided by doing the education, offering testing, medical, um, behavioral health, and um, medication-assisted services. Um, their exchange continues to be held at our location, even though they took over again in August. Um, but we're still providing the services here. Um, we, a couple of the things we did with, um, in reference to our harm reduction was making sure that people had a minimum of two weeks of supplies, um, at reducing um, risks related to contact, um, risk of infection, um, as well as a hardship. Not really worrying about how much they wanted, whether they were um, exchanging um, their syringes um, or not, just giving the people what they needed. Our staff was directed to just say, what do you need to make it through for you know two or three weeks or until you can get back here? Um, you know, um, just our patients, our patients have to be first, those people needing those services. Um, and then we implemented some technology, um, providing, um, doing phone services, video services for those people that don't have access, we could provide a tablet. So if I wanted counseling services, um, crisis type services, we could do that. Um, you know, overall, it's just understanding what what the people want, what they need. And as all the previous presenters have said, we ha we have to be flexible. We have to ask and and be patient driven. Um, that's it. Um, there's some resources on the next page. All of the um, partnerships we have, and I want to thank everybody. Um, for inviting me, it's been an honor. Uh, thank you, Claudette, for that presentation. Um, our last two presenters, including Claudette uh, and Lee, who I'll introduce in a few, uh, were asked to present on their programs of exactly kind of what services are um, happening now, and particularly during the COVID pandemic. So we were really happy and excited that they were able to join us this afternoon to. Um, give us their presentation on how they're continuing their services. Uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce Lee Torres, uh, who is a non-binary Navajo, a Mexican person living and working in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Lee has been working in the HIV, uh, HCV prevention and harm reduction field since 2017 at First Nations Community Health Source. What speaks to me the most about harm reduction is the way it shows people that you're there for them without any judgment. So I'd like to introduce Lee Torres, HIV Prevention Specialist at First Nations Community Health Source. Hello, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, like Elson said, my name's Lee Torres. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an HIV prevention specialist and harm reductionist. I work at First Nations Community Health Source and it's located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna jump into what we've had to change recently. Um, 
obviously we've all had to adapt, so safety measures are taken. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, you can fast forward that one. Um, uh, so we established at our clinic a screening tent. I was one of the first uh, measures implemented and each person every day, no matter if you're a client or if you're an employee, you must get screened before going entering the building as well as like wearing a mask. Go ahead and next slide. So screenings include temperatures read and recorded, questions in regards to COVID, so like any known exposure, traveling out of state for the last 14 days, any symptoms that have been like, you know, coughing, fever, et cetera. Um, now, just because somebody may have answered yes to traveling out of state or may have answered yes to being exposed or they have some type of like symptom, that does not mean that they are denied services. What happens then is like we'll go outside of the building and we'll just wear our masks as like we do inside the office and just ask a series like of questions like we would like in New Mexico, we have what's uh, called the sharps card. So it looks like this. And so we ask for that sharps card. If they don't have it, then we issue them a new one and it just gives us their, um, their client code. And so we receive the code, we get how much uh, supplies they need and then come back into the building, collect them and then go back outside of the building and give them what they need and they can go about their day. Um, and also like if somebody is feeling kind of nervous about having symptoms of COVID, they have the option of getting triaged by a nurse on site, which is nice. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So six feet apart in the office that I work in is very small. So we've had to really think outside the box in terms of like being able to continue providing services in the space that we have. So I'll be talking a bit about that. You can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, can we go back one? There we go. So we've had to implement a lot of things. Um, with limited space in our office, we've had to repurpose our office door into a, a walk-up service window. We have a Dutch door, so we utilize that. So we're able to like have a window and then it was, in our clinic, we've had to add a lot of plexiglass like to have a barrier between clients and providers in regards to like walk-up windows and like front desk windows. So we did this as well. We, per, we, not in this photo, but recently we added plexiglass to our door frame so that it acts more as like a safety barrier for each individual. And the lobby now has limited capacity for our clients. That has greatly helped us in being able to like utilize the walk-up window because it gives some degree of privacy and it allows social distancing to still exist. Um, as I go forward, you can go to the next slide. Uh, social distancing has changed a lot of our daily to day operations and client interactions, but it also allows us to build a different type of rapport with our clients and it uh, has us focusing on like questions to better assist our clients. Um, in regards to asking them if they are a secondary uh, exchange and or a peer exchange and in that case like we will definitely ask questions of like how many folks in their household do they need supplies for like how many other people are they picking up for because in that case especially during times of COVID we're able to just give them what they need um let's see it's also just allowed us to provide things that we feel people just, we feel people need, like, we have a large number of clients that are unsheltered, so we provide water, snacks, um, hand soap, because, like, it's kind of hard to still get hand sanitizer for a large number of people, so we provide those services, and then we also provide, like, condoms, uh, testing for HIV and Hep C, and then we give out um, incentives for those testings as well. 
and you can go to the next slide. So there's been a definitely a surprise in our numbers and you can move forward. So our at First Nations Community Health Service, our syringe service program is still fairly new. It was established in 2018. The program participant numbers have always been under 250. This spring and summer, we've seen our highest participant numbers. So in February, we had like 172 folks. And then come March, we started to see a bit of increase, not too much, but still like 211. April was 360, and then come May was like the largest increase in our numbers, which was 409. Um, now we're not like, we're one of many exchange service programs in Albuquerque, New Mexico, so we're very fortunate. And through talking to other locations, um, it just seems like there's been a jump in the syringe service programs with participant numbers in general. So it's, it's, it's nice to be able to know that like we're here and that there's many other options for our clients to be able to use. Um, it's just like sometimes like I always like wondered like, well, is this just successful for us? Like, or was it just like a generally like a thing that happened to everybody and it was. Um, some of the feedback that we've received from our clients have been that they are using a loan more. So um, just generally like giving them advice on going slower when using their substances and making sure that like they're testing for fentanyl and things of that nature because like most other states, we are seeing an increase in fentanyl in substances used by our clients. Um, some clients are also talking about how they feel safer coming to the syringe service program as opposed to normally buying their syringes off of the street, like or off of an acquaintance, like they're trying to like have less socializing, which is good. And we've also have uh, we're, so there's another service in towns called Dope Services, and they used to do street outreach, but it's been kind of like they had to stop doing street outreach because it would create a large number of people in line together, and that was an issue. So it was um, but by Department of Health in New Mexico, was, they were like recommended to not do that type of street outreach and they'll find people individually and like provide services. But what they've been doing also is they've been able to do delivery service for people who are differently abled or who have like chronic illnesses. So some questions that I've asked some of our clients is like, oh, you know, like you come here often, like, and they'll be picking up for someone and they'll say that that person has a disability. And I'm like, okay, cool here's this service, dope services, they'll be able to come to your door, pick up your needles and also drop off needles for you. So definitely working with all of the organizations in our city to be able to better service, service our clients, definitely. Um, so, that's de so that's good. And so mine's like pretty quick. It's just like, is the success of this program due to the First Nations gaining recognition in the community or a larger impact of the pandemic? I personally think it's both. Like, people are talking to each other. Like, harm reduction services definitely are word of mouth. Like, you either have to go out there and do the outreach and talk to folks or, like, they're telling their friends, like, oh, you can go here to get services. So I think that it's part pandemic and part like we're getting more recognition in the community. Um, I feel like adapting to COVID-19 is something that we've all been doing and there has been definitely some successes for New Mexico specifically. Recently, as of like last week, New Mexico is being able to provide mailing syringe service program. So like we'll be able to mail out supplies to our clients as well as naloxone. So that's something that's very, um, that everyone's really excited about. 
and I'm looking forward to being able to provide that service and just help folks that may not be able to come into town that are living like in the mountains or a little bit like outside of Albuquerque. So that would be great. Um, but again, yeah, I just think that adaptation, like adaptation is good for us and just like being able to meet clients where they're at. Like I feel good working at a clinic where if somebody needs to be able to get wound care, we can provide that for them. If somebody needs to be able to get like, um, behavioral health services, we can provide that and anything as far as like, we have a lot of, um, like domestic violence programs too. So it's definitely good to be able to still have the communication with our clients during this time and be as safe as possible um, in regards to screening and creating social distance. So yeah, but that's the end of my presentation and I appreciate being a part of this. Well, thank you, Lee, for that presentation and providing some real-time information on how it, you know, how you're continuing to provide those services. So thank you for that. <clears throat> and then also thank you to Claudette on her presentation about, you know, the services that they're offering to in, uh, in Alaska, uh, in Juneau, Alaska, and the collaborations that they've made there. Um, so at this time, we're going to give a few minutes um, for questions. Uh, if any of you have questions, if you want to use the chat box and the Q&A part there at the bottom of the Zoom, or if you want to go ahead and just type that in the um, chat box here for our um, presenters. So if you want to do that, feel free to do that. Um, you know, some of the questions that I seen that came in um, were geared towards, um, were geared towards around um, MAT. Um, and that may be another presentation uh, that we are looking at being able to do. So, you know, everyone should be getting an evaluation from this webinar. So feel free to add some topic areas you'd like to see in terms of a webinar um, and a webinar topic. Um, another webinar that we're looking at organizing is around syringe exchange programs, how to develop a syringe exchange program, uh, but also what programs are out there that are serving our native people uh, in our communities, whether urban or rural. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, so keep a lookout for that as well. Um, I don't see any questions per se. Um, um, there was a question early on in the presentation asking, how did you determine how many syringes to purchase for your community? And this question is open for any of our panelists. I can, um, this is Jessica, I can answer just from uh, my experience, the way that the SSP got started was um, very needs based. So um, it started quite small. And then as more people utilized, um, we purchased and supplied uh, more syringes and a wider variety of supplies. So it just kind of started um, with smaller orders and then those grew as the attendance grew. So our syringe exchange is community funded because we like we just got our uh, nonprofit status last week and we've been I believe I don't know like how long it's I've been there three years and so maybe like five years it's been going on. We've been funded by donations community fundraisers. Um, <laughs> cookie decorating classes like everything. Uh, so, you know, I write a check to Nathan and then the provide, uh, uh, Dr. Spencer, who, who runs the exchange, quickly takes that check and cashes it. So it's basically, you know, if we have $3,000, we buy $3,000 worth of supplies. If we have $500, we buy, like, it's based upon mm -hmm. that. Um, so, and then I did see a question somewhere about like how many, you know, how many do people use uh, per day and per week? And that's gonna be very dependent upon somebody. Um, and so, 
my buddy Jeff is on this call and he, he has access to this beautiful video on like the day, a day in the life of, and it also depends on like what somebody's using. So, you know, if they're, you know, shooting Coke, if they're shooting heroin, if they're shooting meth, if they're uh, supplementing in between, you know, with alcohol and benzene, like it's very dependent. So uh, I created a survey monkey and I had texted it out to some people and, um, you know, I got back like two because some people were using two syringes a day because they were supplementing with smoking in between. So it, this is like a tricky question. You know, some people will use a whole pack. Um, some people don't know. Um, it's like, it's like the question of like, well, how many overdoses happen a day? Okay. Well, I don't know because I don't, how many are unreported? You know, so um, I just ask that question every week when I see somebody, I'm like, hey, so what's going on in the street? Uh, well, my buddy overdosed, so I need like three more Narcan kits. Okay. And you just normalize that conversation. It's no, it, it, harm reduction is about normalizing the conversation about what's going on in your life. Well, I overdosed earlier this week. I'm so glad to see you again. I'm so glad you made it. Thanks for coming back. Thank you, Annette and Jessica. Um, we have another question about um, someone wants to see if they could get a copy of the Sharps card, just to see what is um, what information is on the Sharps card. This is for yeah. you, Lee. Yeah, I can totally get, uh, send that out. I I can send it to Savannah and Elton, and then y'all can send it out. Yeah. Um, New Mexico is very fortunate, like it's had an established uh, syringe service program since the 90s. And so as far as like ordering supplies, it's very organized. Like we put in our order to um, Department of Health, they give us what we need for the week. But one thing that really hit us um, in June for New Mexico, the whole state was out of needles because of shipping in regards to we placed our order, Department of Health placed our order, and because of COVID and how it has affected like shipping, the whole state was out of needles for pretty much all of June. So we were really... Uh, it was really tough for a lot of our clients and having conversations with them once they came back when we told them that we had like syringes to provide to them again like there is like it, it made it very solidly and felt really real of like okay this service is like something that so many people in our community need and you know just talking about destigmatizing it all the time, making it a normal conversation is like so important. Thank you everyone and thank you for the questions as well. Um, you know, I just want to also thank Jessica and Annette for their presentation and for kind of, um, you know, presenting about the harm reduction concept and implementing those strategies into your own programming. So hopefully we'll be able to utilize this presentation as a resource and the presenters as a resource to help you in um, continuing and developing your programs that you see that there's a need for. So, so thank you. Um, yeah, so we have a, um, another comment about asking what is all in the kit. We will share the slides um, once we get all of those together and in a format where we can share it. It is a very large file. Um, so that will be in a follow up email. And um, we also have a comment about sharing information from Mary DeBerry. There's um, a historical trauma and healing webinar on September 9th. Um, you can send that information to me, Savannah, who's um, contact information is in the webinar registration. Okay, thank you so much. And there was also a comment about being government funding uh, in regards to programming um, 
so, you know, and then also asking a tribal council to maybe help to assist with what you can't purchase with federal government funding. So have any of you experienced that limitation if you are government funding? And if so, how, how have you strategized um, about the use of allocating funds? Um, so I'm government funded in, we don't, like we don't have fentanyl's test strips to give out because we are government funded. Like that's one of the supplies that Department of Health does not give us. And so I'm actually looking to see how much it would cost to buy fentanyl test strips for our department. And I am also a part of a harm reduction strategy group for our county. And I asked Dope Services, who is a part of that group, like how do they get funding for purchasing fentanyl strips and they just said that they do they get donations from community members or they also just do some type of fundraising similar to what like Annette had talked about. So um, so I guess I got a, a couple of things and I don't know if this is appropriate so maybe Elton you can just raise your hand and stop me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I got approached by NASTAD to start a tribal SAP call to talk about how to make syringe access programs more available uh, to tribal um, organizations or to get them started or think, you know, to, to provide support to them. Um, I work, uh, the clinic that I work at is not affiliated. They're very clear that they are not an SAP. Everybody that works here volunteers at the exchange. We, we are all part of the exchange. And so um, when I go to the exchange, because I work in social services and my face, so I have, I have a very huge dual role relationship in my community. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm bridged. Um, but if you, so if anybody's interested in participating in this tribal uh, SAP, call, please email me so that I can at least maybe like we could get this started. Uh, I think it's needed um, and it sounds like it's needed. That would be great. And then um, so if you have the tribal opiate response grant or you work with anybody or you are tied in and affiliated, um, it falls under prevention. The fentanyl testing strips fall under prevention. Um, and so, and, and I would get with your GPO about it because there's so much, you know, like IHS is dumping so much money into this stuff about uh, that. So, so, I mean, harm, harm reduction is a huge topic right now. And, uh, and it does, it falls under harm reduction. So if you need any uh, tips and tricks about how to write that in, you know, let us know. Well, thank you, Annette strategies right <laughs> and it's all about the wording um there was a comment you can get around the ban on federal funding fentanyl test strips they cost a approximately a dollar each if the administration changes in the next election then the federal funding ban on fentanyl strips may disappear fingers crossed so that was just a follow-up um, comment on that uh, but i really like um you know the explanation that you gave it in terms of uh, volunteering, you know, the dual role that you play as well, but just be very um, knowledgeable about how that operates just so your programmings won't be affected in that way. Uh, we had one more question. Um, as I know, we went over about 30 minutes, but we kind of um, assumed we would and glad that we still have people on the webinar. So the last question would be, how does harm reduction work on tribal land? And that's kind of a broad question, I guess, but I, you know, a majority of you who present to do work in tribal communities or with tribal agencies, I guess it might just be more of the perspective of how harm reduction is received uh, in our tribal communities, um, you know, and how that might be uh, explained a little bit more to them about the strategies and approaches. Yeah, I 
am based in the city, so we're not like on tribal land. And when we do outreach, it's mostly within like the urban area. So I I can't answer this, but I imagine it would just like it would depend on each community and like how well like it's received and how I guess like the conversations are happening like through from like elders to youth and vice versa I think that that's like the key um I know that I run into a lot of clients here that are coming from the reservation and like we have some people that even drive from Phoenix here and like from the like the Navajo Nation here to pick up to go back to the reservation. So I think everything there is mainly just driven by community and it would be nice if that would change. I um, absolutely agree, Lee, uh, that it is um, community specific. So I just have like one experience, but it could look very different to a variety of other tribal lands and communities. But um, again, I think creating a really clear purpose and a really clear goal and having really open, transparent communication with tribal leadership, with community members, um, making sure that the goals are in line with the values that the community supports and then continuing the work um, internally and externally on um, reducing stigma in the production uh, or the prevention of harms. Good, thank you for that. Um, and again, I want to thank our co-presenters. Um, we were really excited to get um, this webinar together and really use our um, regional membership to make our connections to people who are I would say experts in the field of harm reduction. So it was really great to get a diverse perspective and also with our relatives from Alaska as well. We really appreciate you um, taking the time and presenting on the work that you're doing there. You know, our regional networks as well. Um, Annette seems to be a well-connected uh, expert, as I say. So um, I know they uh, do work with the um, regional ATT, AT TTC, I believe. So that would be great um, as a resource. And Jessica um, with the National Northwest Portland Area Union Health Board, um, you know, and their work with using ECHO during this time in terms of virtual um, services. So thank you all for being here. I just want to let everyone know that there is a virtual National Native Harm Reduction Summit that will be taking place September 22nd through the 24th. Um, and you can get more information at the National Indian Health Board website at www.nihb.org. Uh, this is the conference that typically took place uh, in Minoman, Minnesota uh, with the White Earth uh, tribal community, but it has expanded now to be more national. So we encourage everyone uh, to attend that conference. I believe it is free, so please feel free to sign up. Um, and I just encourage everyone to do that. Uh, any last words, Savannah? Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, please keep a lookout for a new website coming in the next couple of months and then also um, our webinars that are coming up. We plan to have one throughout the rest of the year, um, at least one monthly webinar. So um, thank you for joining us and this webinar will be posted on our Facebook page and sent out in the follow up email. Okay, thank you all. Yeah, have a good rest of the day. Bye, thank you.